Hello everyone, thank you for joining us in this lesson. Today we are going to talk about strings. I'll do my best to demystify the complexity behind the many types of strings that Rust offers and also give you an example and we'll try and dive deep into each type. Okay, let's start with the basics. All strings in Rust are guaranteed to be a valid encoding of UTF-8 byte sequences. If you're coming from C or C++, you will probably be familiar with null terminated strings. Well, in Rust, there is no such thing. In fact, a null is a valid byte of value in Rust. There are two main types of strings in Rust, string and a string slice. The latter is usually pronounced as a stir and is written with an ampersand and the letter str after it. Let's start with string. It is usually declared in multiple ways, but most commonly you'll find it declared with the toString function like you see here. The string type is stored as a vector of bytes and it is guaranteed to always be a valid UTF-8 sequence. As soon as you declare the string with the toString function, it will be allocated in the heap. Let's take a quick look at how the string type is compositioned. As we mentioned earlier, it is extremely similar to a vector of bytes. In fact, it is a vector of bytes. That means the string internal composition is made of a pointer, a length, and a capacity. So in our case here, S1 will have a length of 19 characters and a capacity of 19 characters. The pointer section of the string will point to a region in memory where the string itself is stored. The good thing about string is that it is extremely flexible and it is growable. So you're not just stuck with initial capacity that it was created with. If you append more characters to that string, it will automatically grow and new memory regions will be allocated for that string. So your initial pointer that you started with will most likely change if that string grows bigger. And this is where the flexibility lies. Let's talk about string slices. String slice has a fixed size and it cannot be mutated. It is also a reference to a valid sequence of UTF-8 byte. Now string slices are extremely useful in that you can use them to view inside heap allocated strings. Let's take a quick look at how string slices are defined internally. They have two variables, a pointer and a length. This makes them extremely useful. The pointer could point to a region in memory and then the length will be used as a limit on how much memory to read, i.e. how much of the string to read. There are a couple of ways to create string slices. You can either have it as pointing or referring to a substring of the string type, like so, or you can create what we call a string literal. Now, string slices that refers to heap allocated strings or a portion of the heap allocated strings are pretty straightforward. String literals, on the other hand, are a bit special in that they are allocated in read-only memory. And that usually means they are allocated inside the binary executable itself. Okay, now let's switch gears here and see how we can concatenate strings together. There are multiple ways to do that. Uh, if you look here at line 8, for example, we're using the format macro to concatenate two string. The first string is a heap allocated string, and the second one, S2, is a string literal. Now, the resulting string that you will get will be a heap allocated string. So S3 at line 8 is a heap allocated string. Another way you can concatenate strings is by using the push function. Now, there are two push functions, one that pushes character into an existing immutable heap allocated string or a push string where you can actually add a string and append it to an existing immutable heap allocated string, like you see here in line 11 and line 12. 
So we added the space at line 11, so we can have the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog without having it attached together. Now the other way you can also concatenate two strings together is by using the plus sign. The only rule here is that the first string needs to be a heap allocated string, so S1 in our case is heap allocated, and the subsequent strings can be string slices. Okay, great. So moving on from concatenation, let's look at basic conversion from string to integers or floats. It's the same mechanism, the same function. So at line 16 here, you can see that we're defining N1 as an I32 type with a value of 55. At line 17, we're trying to convert that I32 into a string by using the toString function. It's worth bearing in mind that the to string at line 17 is actually returning a heap allocated string. It's not returning a string slice. Okay, now at line 20, we are creating a string literal of the value 55. And then in line 21, we'll try and convert that into an integer using the parse function. Of course, if you're doing unwrap there, you do have to capture the error as well, just in case S7 contains a, a value that is not convertible to integer. So just make sure you add expect or capture the error in a more meaningful way. Okay, now let's try and print all of these values from S1 to all the way to uh, N2. And let's run the program. Now you will notice here that S3 is fully attached together and this is the concatenation that we've done with a plus sign. We are clearly missing a space there. As I mentioned, you can append either a string literal or a string slice to it. So let's do that real quick. All right, that fixes it, great. Switching gears again, let's declare S1 as a string literal. Now we will see a different function to convert a string literal to a heap allocated string. And this is using the from function. If you recall from earlier, we used the to string function to convert a string literal to a heap allocated string. Now, what if we wanted to convert a heap allocated string into a string slice? Well, we need to work with slices, more specifically a string slice, which is essentially a reference to part of a string. As you can see at line eight, we are creating a string slice by using the two dots. These are called the range specifier. The left hand side is the start index, which is always included in the resulting slice. And on the right hand side is the ending index, which is not inclusive, i.e. it's not really included. So what you usually do as a mental arithmetic, we always take one minus the ending index. So in our example here at line 8, the resulting string slice will be the three-letter word for the. And we will do the same thing at line 9 to have a string slice that points to the word quick. Now to display the remainder of the string, which is a brown fox, we could do it by having the string slice pointing to a starting index of 10 and an ending index of 19 that will result in the string of brown fox. However, string slices offers us, well, we can call it a shortcut annotation by putting the two dots and omitting the ending index. So what that will do, it will define the ending index as the end of the string, which is the equivalent of 19 in this case. We can also do the reverse by omitting the starting index entirely and just putting in the ending index, just like you see here at line 12. So this particular string will result in the quick from the S1 variable. Okay, great. Now we can summarize our both methods of specifying starting index or using the shortcut annotation of omitting starting and the ending index by printing the variables at line eight and nine with one println macro 
and the variables at 11 and 12, we should see identical outputs. And this is where string slices become extremely useful. For example, when you're creating a function that requires a string parameter, you do not have to create a heap allocated string as a parameter. You can just create a string slice that refers to that string, the one that is heap allocated. So let's try and summarize this by actually creating a function called print me and we'll add a parameter as a string slice to this function and we'll take all of the code that we've written so far insert it into the function and then what we can do we can coerce the heap allocated string to be converted to a string slice by just adding the reference sign there which is the ampersand in rust this feature is more formally known as deref coercing it allows us to turn any past heap allocated string reference using the borrow operator, the ampersand, to a string slice. This is absolutely perfect, especially in situations where our function doesn't need to own our mutated string that it is working with. A rule of thumb here is you should always use a string slice in a function if you're not mutating the string. Now coercion is a completely separate topic that we can probably explore in another lesson but for now understand that to convert from a heap allocated string to a string slice you can add the ampersand and then the heap allocated string uh, variable name in there it will coerce it if it was as part of a function. Let's put everything that we've learned so far into something useful. What if we create a function that is similar to the built-in function called split? It's essentially split string and you can pass a character that the function will use as the limiter. Okay, we're gonna try and implement this ourselves using everything we've learned so far. First of all, at line eight, we're gonna declare a function called split and we will pass s1 as a, a reference to a string slice there and the return type of this function will be a vector of string slices so as you can see here this function doesn't actually mutate the string in any way it's just using references it's going to split the string depending on the delimiter that we're using so as you can see here at line 14 we are defaulting to space as a delimiter but later on we're going to improve it a little bit and then give the user the option to put different delimiters now one thing to note here is that at line 13 we are converting the string into a byte array we have to be careful here because a byte array does not necessarily correspond to the characters that are available in this string. For example, if you have UTF-8 emojis in the string, then iterating through the array like this is probably not a good idea. It's more appropriate if you iterate through characters instead. Generally, converting the string into a byte array and indexing through it like we're doing here is always a bad idea because you never know what type you will get in return. Is it a byte value? Is it a character? Is it a graphene cluster or a string slice? I mean, all of this sounds overly complex. Uh, I am planning to do another video uh, regarding UTF-8 and the complexity around it. That should clear things up, hopefully. You will see that we are declaring three variables, one called index at line 9, word delimiter at line 10, and the resulting vector. Now the index is essentially is just to keep track of where we are and the word delimiter is every time we find a space character that will be our marker of where we start in the next iteration. Now at line 14 we just compare the actual byte against the space byte character and then at line 15 if we do find the space character there we push the string slice into the vector now the word delimiter variable gets incremented by one simply because the next time we iterate and we find a space character we don't include it and we continue doing this way and at the end of the function we just return that vector okay great now our function is ready let's give it a go and see the output brilliant Visualizing what we've done so far, you will see how the string is represented in memory, like so. And then in each iteration, 
we are pushing the string slice into the vector. So in this case, we have four string slices that end up in the vector. Let's try and make this function a little bit more flexible. As it stands right now, it only splits on space character and is taking the space character as a, the default delimiter. Now, if we give the user an option to define their own delimiters, that will be really awesome. So we declare a function parameter called split car of type u8. Essentially, it's a byte character. Let's make it a bit more interesting here and modify the string by adding commas and put the delimiter as a comma. We run the program and let's have a look at the output. Brilliant. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the lesson. It was a really hard one to make simply because of the sheer complexity of the Rust strings. Uh, I am planning to do another lesson shortly, so please stay tuned, subscribe, and I will see you next time.